It's one of the number one needs of all human beings. The greatest need of children, in fact, adults, is that they don't know their purpose. I have nine kids, five boys, four girls. I've asked them all at one point, what do you want to be when you grow up? One son told me his senior year in high school he wanted to be a doctor. That's what he's become. Another son told me his sophomore year in high school he wanted to be a tennis pro. That's what he is. Jamie told me her freshman year in college that she wanted to be an occupational therapist. She's a senior at uh, Portland State, and that's what she's pursuing. One of my sons, his freshman year of college, uh, said he wanted to go into criminology. He graduated last year from University of Louisville, and that's what he's pursuing. Um, My kids uh, attend at 1045. Uh, if you, if you come this hour, you have a chance, you'll see, what do we got, four or five of them here today, so uh, you can uh, meet uh, several of them, talk to them. Uh, when I talk to people on a significant level, I ask them, what is it that fires you up? What causes you to get up in the morning? Uh, all of us <clears throat> need to discover what our purpose is. Uh, biggest tragedy for many people is they never discover their purpose. Uh, the question of purpose is one of the most important questions in life. Why do I go to work? Why raise a family? Why come to church? To answer these questions, we must understand the purpose for our lives. The question I want to ask and answer today is what is our purpose? This is the first in a seven-week series in which we'll be looking at seven of the most important things Jesus taught his disciples. This year I asked my staff, I've done it other years too, uh, for suggestions when I'm planning what messages we'll do during the year. Uh, And uh, so I selected a five-week series. Chris uh, Quinn suggested we'll do that this summer. I selected a six-week series that Micah suggested. We did that this fall, last fall. And today I'm beginning a seven-week series that Beth Werner uh, suggested. Uh, She is our children's uh, minister, and she grew up in Washington, D.C. under the uh, leadership of uh, Richard Halverson, Dick Halverson, uh, pastor of Fourth Presbyterian Church from 1958 to 1981. He left that to become chaplain of the Senate from 1981 to 1994. She also learned under the leadership of Doug Coe the founder and leader of the fellowship for 60 years. Uh, The fellowship puts on the national prayer breakfast every year in February. It's an interesting event. The president's there, people from the Senate and the House, and uh, pulls people from both aisles. Leaders around the world come. They're also responsible for uh, prayer breakfasts around the country like in Portland. And um, he, Doug Coe traveled to all 196 countries in the world and established a prayer breakfast in many of those countries. Uh, Beth's father died when she was 14, and so she said Doug became like a second father to her. And she spent a lot of time at his house because her best friend uh, was Doug's daughter. And uh, she had many uh, dinners with them, and and he would ask his kids, what are the seven key things that Jesus taught? And they would ask it and answer it. What is the purpose? What is the gospel? What is the work? These are what we're going to consider these next seven weeks. What is the ministry? What is the church? What is the method of leadership? And what is the kingdom? What is the purpose? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Apostle Paul wrote, I want to know Christ 
Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. He says, my purpose is to know Christ, to have a relationship with Christ, a love relationship with him. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Francis of Assisi, uh, one of his students came up to him one day and says, hurry, the emperor is coming to Rome. Everybody's gathering and people were gathered on both sides of the road and Assisi didn't go with him, but he wrote on a piece of paper, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And he gave it to his student. He says, put it on a stick and hold it up to the emperor if you get a chance for him to take it. And he can read it and understand his purpose. If you have a chance to meet the president or LeBron James or Tom Brady or the king of kings, which would you choose? Can you imagine anything greater than to know the king of kings? That's our purpose. Jesus said, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Jesus said, if you believe in me, if you follow me, if you love me, out of you will flow rivers of water, like a fountain. We love fountains. People come to gather around fountains. If we know Jesus, we become like a fountain, he says, and we attract people. So turn to our text today, Matthew 22, 35 to 40, in your Bible. On our Bibles, under the seats, it's on page 990. One of them, an expert in the law. Now this happened in the final week of Jesus' life. He's in Jerusalem teaching at the temple. He is very popular. He just raised Lazarus from the dead. And John tells us that at that point, many Jews came to believe in him. And they were all coming to Bethany to see Lazarus and Jesus. And Jesus has just come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey with people waving palm branches. Throngs of people are cheering him on as he comes in. And now he's being bombarded with questions. And one of them tested him. In other words, this is not just a question. He's trying to catch Jesus. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He says, you know, in the law, the law refers to the first five Books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He says, there are 613 commandments in the law. Which is the greatest? Now, this Pharisee would have memorized. Can you imagine that? Memorizing these five books? He would have memorized that. He knew all 613 commands. Which is the greatest? And Jesus answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He quotes Deuteronomy 6.5, which is the most famous passage in the Old Testament, where Moses says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, in Mark's gospel, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Did you notice the differences? So Matthew says, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Moses writes, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And Mark says, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Critics say, well, which is it? Is Mark right Or is Matthew right? Now, we just talked the last four weeks. We believe 
that the Bible teaches that all of it is God-inspired, that God inspired the writers by the Holy Spirit in such a way that they wrote without error. So you say, well, which is it? Is it Matthew or Mark? Well, this tells you something important about the writers. They felt the freedom to not have to quote Jesus verbatim. They could summarize. We know they summarized because the Gospels tell us Jesus taught for hours. But you can read through the Sermon on the Mount in like 15 minutes. It's a summary. It's the high points. So apparently Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But Matthew just leaves off strength. That's okay. Moses leaves out mind. So Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, the law is the first five books of the Old Testament. The prophets is everything else. The poets, the prophets, all of the commandments hang on these two commandments. So the Torah first five books of the Old Testament, has 613 commandments. The cliff notes would be the Ten Commandments. But Jesus gives an executive summary. He says, these two commandments covers the whole thing. All 613, all 10, turns out the first five of the Ten Commandments are about loving God. The second five are about loving our neighbor. So Jesus says you can sum them all up with love God and love your neighbor. The purpose of our lives is to love God and people. So if our purpose is to love God, how do we do that? If you say, I'm going to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, so help me, you'll never get there. When you're trying to love God out of obligation, you make it all about yourself. And that's what the Pharisees did. To avoid love for God being an obligation, we need to see that to love God means to fall in love with Him. I think we make mistakes as followers of Christ when we put all our emphasis on serving God, sharing Christ, and obeying God. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God. Focusing on ministry over love is like saying to a potential mate, will you be the mother of my children or the father of my children? No. You don't get married with the purpose of having children. Children grow out of that intimacy. Loving God and our neighbor is a prerequisite for serving people, sharing Christ, and obeying God. Jesus says we're to love God with all our heart. What's the significance of loving God with all our heart? When The Bible talks about heart. It doesn't refer to the muscle that pumps blood. It's talking about the inner being. It's the control tower in our lives. It's the center of our being. It's the source of our deepest desires. Jesus says the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Have you ever blurted out something terrible to somebody? Said something really mean? And then afterwards you're embarrassed why did I do that? Well, what happened? You're just speaking out something you've allowed to grow up or build up inside of you, resentment or anger, and it just came out. To deal with those feelings, we need an inner heart change. God says through the prophet Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. We can't love God on our own. Our purpose is to love God. We can't even do that. We come to Christ and we say, 
I just come, I fall down before you in your mercy. Would you come into my life? And then he puts his Holy Spirit inside us. He begins to create a new heart within us, a new center of our being. Solomon says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Guard what you think about. Guard what you focus on. Guard what you look at. Why? Because you've fallen in love with God. You want to love what He loves. You want to hate what He hates. You want to focus on what He cares about. Jesus also says we are to love God with all our soul. What's the significance of loving God with our soul? The soul is the spiritual counterpart to the body. Nefesh, the Hebrew word uh, for soul, means it's the totality of a person's life or being, your complete, unique self. The Greek word for soul, suke, from which we get our word psychology, refers to one's unique personality. It's what makes you uniquely you. It's the part of you that goes with you into heaven. To love God with all your soul is to love God uniquely as only you can do. That means you're going to love God maybe a little differently than I will. Jesus also also says we're to love God with all our mind. To love God with our mind uh, means to fix our minds on God, on Jesus. Apostle Paul says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. The writer to the Hebrew says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. When we allow ungodly thoughts such as lust or pride or greed to dominate our thinking, it pollutes our minds. Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We want to take captive every thought. We want to think good thoughts. We want to think kind thoughts about other people. Depending on your point of view, odds are you're either pro-Trump or pro-Pelosi. You're either on Team Queen or Team Megan. But God says we're to love everybody because everybody's made in the image of God. We're to treat everyone with respect and kindness. We're to view people the way God does. I think one way we can grow in that is spend time every day in God's Word. I encourage you to spend at least 15 minutes a day Remember, we've talked about the last few weeks that all the Scripture is God-breathed. So when you're spending time in the Bible, you're actually hearing directly from God. Uh, Loving God with all our mind also means to use our intellect. Astronomer Galileo said, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forgo their use. God's given us great minds to use to pursue knowledge. Some people say Christians are anti-science. Quite the contrary. Some of the greatest scientists in history have been Christians. We're not afraid of, of science disproving God. Quite the opposite. We believe that the more we learn about this world, the more we learn about this amazing universe, the more it points to an intelligent creator, God. The Apostle Paul writes, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Paul says you can see that there's a God just by looking around. How many beautiful places there are in this world. Being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. 
Jesus also says we're to love God with all our strength. What's the significance of loving God with all our strength? The Hebrew word for strength, maod, denotes a sense of exceeding effort. So heart, soul, and mind refer to our inner self, and strength refers to our bodies, our outer self. So we love God with our might, with our physical strength. To love God with all our strength might mean to set our alarms a little earlier so we can spend time with God before we head off to our work or school. It might mean getting up on Sunday and coming to church. It could mean eating carefully and making time for physical exercise. The expert in the law asked Jesus to name the greatest commandment out of the 613. Jesus surprised him by adding a second commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The religious expert expected a singular answer. Jesus surprised him by adding Leviticus 19.18 to Deuteronomy 6.4-9. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Why did he add this one? Because he knew the expert in the law did not realize that you can't love God without loving your neighbor. You can't separate the two. When we love our neighbor, we're loving God. When we don't love our neighbor, we're not loving God. Loving God includes loving our neighbor. When we love our neighbor, we love God because everyone's created in God's image. Whatever we do for our neighbor, we do for God. Moreover, Jesus tells us how to love our neighbor. A new commandment I give you, love one another. How? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. How did God love us? He gave his son to die for us. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. That's how we love people, by sacrificing ourselves for them, doing what they need rather than what we want. So what are the big takeaways from this passage? What do we learn about our purpose in the world? The ultimate purpose of life as defined by Jesus is to love God and love people. It's not mission. It's not bearing fruit. It's not making disciples. These are all byproducts of loving God. You love God and you want to serve people. You love God and you want to tell people how they can know God through Jesus Christ. You love God and you want to live an obedient life that honors Him. The key to loving God is not to see it as a duty, but to fall in love with God. If you're married or have been married or you have a boyfriend or have had a boyfriend or girlfriend, you talk about falling in love. That's what we're to do with God. Loving God means to give Him all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, you love Him with all that you have. And loving God includes loving our neighbor. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you make things simple. You summarize. You give the big points so we can get it. Our purpose is to love you and love people. We like to make everything complicated and difficult and God, we want to love you. Help us to do so better. We want to love people. There's some people that just are hard. We have a hard time with that. Help us to realize we can't separate that and not love them. I want you to pray right now. If you love God, would you tell him that? Tell him you want to grow at loving him this week.
And then tell them you want to love your neighbor, your family, the people you work with, people you go to school with, people you live near. And maybe particularly those ones you're having a hard time loving, tell him you want his help to do that this week. You pray.